Hello, I'm Leonardo DiCaprio. And I'm Quentin Tarantino. We're here to do Notes on a Scene. We're going to break down the character as best we can. Of Rick Dalton. Everything that me and Leo talked about to get us to form who this character was and is. And I do want to establish that he's the one with the photographic memory. <laughs> so if I can't remember some names. It's why I'm here. It's why I'm here. <laughs> Rachel, <laughs> Sam Wanamaker. Hey, Sam, sorry about the wet hand. Oh, don't worry about it. I'm used to it with you. <laughs> I just want you to know I'm the one who cast you, and I could not be more delighted that you're doing this. Oh, well, 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 thank you, Sam. I, I appreciate it. That's a good part. Yeah. It's the day in the life of a man sort of going not only through an emotional breakdown, but a, a and a transition in his career and a realization that time has sort of passed him by, that culture has passed him by. but creating a character that is literally on set, working on a job that, for the first time, he's being sort of challenged. Yeah, yeah. Now, Rick, about your hair. Oh, what about my hair? I want to go with a different hairstyle. <laughs> what? Something more hippie-ish. You, 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 you want him to look like a hippie? Rick Dalton represented a certain type of actor that came out in the late 50s and the early 60s. A few spots on some television shows, a few smaller parts in uh, like military ensemble, you know, in the background of submarine movies and stuff. People that are comparative to him would be people like Ed Burns, George Maharis, who was on the show Route 66, Ty Harden, who was on uh, Bronco, and then eventually he landed on NBC on a TV show called Bounty Law. On the same year, over on CBS, Steve McQueen landed on a very similar show about a bounty hunter called Wanted Dead or Alive. And for a period of time, they were uh, uh, kind of uh, similar in uh, uh, fame and, and popularity. Then both of them proved to be popular enough that during uh, their hiatus, they started doing some uh, uh, a film, uh, like a feature film. Eventually, during that hiatus time, McQueen did Magnificent Seven. And that was that. He was a movie star. But Rick was still kind of Jay Cahill, the guy from Bounty Law. But when Bounty Law uh, uh, was finished, I think Bounty Law came on in the 59, 58 season and ended in the 63, 64 season. Where it made a contract with Universal and did about four feature films. However, none of them really quite worked out. Some of them were okay, but he never pulled off the TV to movie star transition. And so now it's 1969 and things haven't worked out for him. So now he's guesting on other people's shows. Mm -hmm like The Green Hornet, or Land of the Giants, or Lancer, or Ron Eli's Tarzan, Bad Guy of the Week on this show versus that show. And he's thinking about going to Italy to start a spaghetti western career. They were a certain type of leading man that was promoted back then. Kind of handsome, rugged guys, spent their whole careers running pocket combs through their pompadours. But by 1969, they never saw this happening. The culture had changed. Yeah. And now the new leading man is not He-Man kind of macho guys that put pomade in their hair. It's skinny, androgynous, shaggy-haired type guys. So now it's Michael Sarazan. Now it's Christopher Jones. Now it's like the hippie sons of famous people like uh, young even Michael Pomade. Douglas and even Arlo Guthrie starring in movies. You know, now if Rick's going to get a part of one of their movies, he's probably going to be the cop who's busting them. Right. Mm -hmm. And everything he's been taught about being likable and being a, a leading man and uh, uh, like people have to like you if they're going to want to get you into their homes. Rick doesn't understand any of this stuff as far as New Hollywood is concerned. If he was offered deliverance, he turned it down. What? No one wants to see that. Who the hell wants to see that? <laughs> <laughs> he's wrong, but he doesn't know that. It's the Hollywood he'd been taught. It's official, old buddy. Well, has been. It was interesting with Quentin to be able to work on this sort of emotional breakdown that, that Rick is having, this realization that time has passed him by. I, mean, I think in a similar way that McQueen wasn't coming from this place where, like, say, Paul Newman was. Mm -hmm. Rick's doesn't come from the, the method. Well, of course not. Concept. I mean, he, he probably thinks all that. In fact, he does think all that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about when you see him uh, do this Lancer show where he's playing this bad guy with a director who actually believes in him. And he's not just the standard issue heavy. The whole thing that 
the director wants to do is change Rick's look. Mm -hmm. And Rick has never changed his look his entire career. Very much like a 50s leading man, all right? The way he wore his hair then is the way he's gonna wear his hair forever. This director wants to change your look. And one of the ways he does it is he puts a long haired wig on you and he puts a a mustache on you. And he kind of wants you to play the leader of these rustlers as if he's uh, the leader of a Hells Angels gang or something. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is you have only seen yourself one kind of way. And we've only seen you one kind of way. And even the audience of this world has only seen Rick one kind of way. Mm -hmm. But when you see you in that wig, you don't have to be a relic of 1959. Right. You could be a modern actor. You could, you could be in a new Hollywood movie. You could be in a movie directed by Bob Fosse or, or, or Scorsese. You don't eat lunch? I've got a scene after lunch. Yeah? Eating lunch before I do a scene makes me sluggish. I believe it's the job of an actor, and I say actor, not actress, because the word actress is nonsensical. And you and I had a lot of discussions about whether, you know, these sort of pivotal scenes with the the young lady in the movie who's kind of this Mm -hmm. young Meryl Streep who's telling Rick, hey, things aren't that bad. You know, step up to the plate. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a working actor, and I take my job seriously. By the way, this other actress he's talking about is nine. Right, exactly. (laughs) It's the actor's job to avoid impediments to their performance. It's the actor's job to strive for 100% effectiveness. Naturally, we never succeed, but it's the pursuit that's meaningful. Who are you? You can call me Marabella. She kind of inspires him and pushes <laughs> pushes him to, 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 to really take his job seriously. We had a lot of discussions about whether, mm-hmm. you know, whether to play through this sort of cowardly lion (laughs) drapery that Rick has of this giant wig and this mustache and him feeling miserable about himself and his Mm -hmm. life. And we weren't sure whether to do, you know, this predominant, Mm -hmm. this huge chunk of Rick's character in this makeup, but it really turned out to be amazing because Mm -hmm. you see visually on this face that he's making a a, a huge pivotal transition in his life through that makeup. And we had a lot of different talks about how do you portray this character uh, of Rick Dalton, the, the humanity of him while he's on set. Line? I mean, right away we watch a tremendous amount of westerns. Not only westerns, but a lot of B-westerns that I wouldn't even be able to have access to, which of course Mm -hmm. Quentin is able to screen in his screening room and has, (laughs) you know, an archive of. The show that's the closest to Bounty Law would be One in Dead or Alive. So I watched about 13 or 14 episodes of Wanted Dead or Alive, which I had no problem doing, to pick six or seven mm-hmm. that I could I handpick for Leo for, for him to watch that I thought he would enjoy and mm-hmm. like. All right, this has gone far enough. Hand over the matches. I'm sorry. Don't make me kill you, mister. And it was also kind of interesting because Leo wasn't the biggest fan of, of Steve McQueen, which is rare for a young male actor because mostly young male actors like worship at the altar of Steve McQueen. And it worked. He actually liked the episodes and he actually liked liked McQueen Mm -hmm. in the episodes. He liked him as Josh. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of my job to show him enough so he would have a really good knowledge. Mm -hmm. A lot of these TV shows and a lot of these very talented actors that, you know, were maybe going to make the transition to film in this new era but kind of got stuck in that in that realm. And Ralph Meeker was a, yeah. an actor that we looked at a lot because I think we both had this amazing affinity towards him because obviously Quentin is an, a, a cinephile, but he's a lover of these actors that maybe an entire generation hasn't heard of. And he really puts them talent-wise as far as how they affect him as an audience member up with the best of the best. Oh, and talking so, about Ralph Meeker, he's one of my, literally my favorite actors of all time. Of all time. <laughs> sure, you'll make a deal for her, like you did for Christina. You held her under custody in a hospital and you let her get away. You let her get killed. And then you start to say, wow, this guy, this guy was immensely talented. And maybe time and history had sort well, of I gotta passed say, him by. He is one of my favorite actors. And so the idea that Leo wasn't that familiar with him, but then the next day, all he wanted to do was talk to me about Ralph Meeker. I couldn't be more happy mm-hmm. that you were so excited about him. Mm-hmm. Well, I have more of that where that came from. <laughs> Give me more. Well, because to me, it was why, why he was so pivotal, I think, when was because we were in discussion with what kind of actor Rick is. Mm-hmm. That he had been trained in the world of television, that he had been trained, not like formally trained, but yeah. there's a real yeah. talent that lies within him mm-hmm. that needs to be brought out 
lot that needs to be pushed, you know, and Ralph Meeker kind of was... Well, no, Ralph, Ralph Meeker... Whereas some of the other actors yeah, yeah. I felt, you know, yeah. didn't have the talent level that I feel or the potential that Rick Dalton did have. Yeah. Ralph Meeker did. And that, all those things that he gives us, I mean, not, not only do you get a, a plethora of, of films and television to watch, you get a, an, a massive backstory and history of, of who the character is and who the man is, and the relationship that he has, has had with Cliff in the past which was important for both Brad and myself because there was this immediate understanding between Brad and myself of what we'd been through. It, it gave us this ability to sort of just fit naturally into our character's shoes and improvise knowing this history that Quentin had created. You know, if every actor could be blessed with that type of backstory going into a movie, it's, it's, uh, it's every actor's dream, really. To my right is Bounty Law series lead and Jake Cahill himself, Rick Dalton. And to my left is Rick Stutt Double Cliff Booth. I could talk about all the different movies that Rick did and all of his credits that he did before then and this and that and this career versus that career. I, I could chapter and verse. At some point though, you're not doing a film book about Rick Dalton. You're playing a character that it has to actually be alive and, and carry through in scenes. In a very nice way, Leo would say, okay, all that's well and good <laughs> about all this minutia. I need something to act. <laughs> what am I doing in this scene? <laughs> Stop talking about what he's done in the past and tell me who am I? And what was really interesting was we kind of found that together. And the way we found it, rather than me just coming up with a bunch of stuff, I still went to the past. I would talk about this actor, say George Meharis or that actor. I'd tell something about their life. But in talking about it, all of a sudden I would say something that Leo would kick into. And when he would kick into that, I would, oh, hey, that's an actable thing. Mm -hmm. That is something, that's a character. Mm -hmm. That's not just information, that's a character. And we were able to come up with a few bits like that, that now actually we had a character that we didn't have before. And the biggest example of that is I told Leo about this show from like the early 70s that I was a big fan of, and actually Brad was a big fan of when we were both kids. Alias Smith and Jones. Alias Smith and Jones. And I told him about the actor Pete Duell who was on the show. You're right, Sheriff. It isn't going exactly according to plan, but we couldn't let you take Penny out that door. You see, we promised to take her with us. And somewhere in the second season, he committed suicide. I remember that really well back then because I was a big fan of the show, and I think it was probably the first time I ever understood the concept of suicide. Oh, my God, he died? Well, how did he die? Well, he committed suicide. What's that? Seven. Eight. What's that? Well, he killed himself. He killed himself? Why did he kill himself? I don't know. I guess he was depressed. What has he got to be depressed about? He's Hannibal Hayes. Mm. <laughs> He's the coolest guy on television. Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of research and found out a little bit that he had a bit of a drinking problem. It sounds like the guy was undiagnosed bipolar and he had mood swings. And the reason that he was drinking was to self-medicate himself. Leo got that. <laughs> Say, uh, Get me to you, Sam. Sam, Sam uh, <coughs> if you got me covered up in all this, uh, <coughs> this junk, uh, how's the audience gonna know it's me? I hope they don't. Mm. Now, he, we already had Rick a drinker, but the whole thing of undiagnosed bipolar and not knowing how that works and the weird pendulum swings of emotion that you would have, especially if you don't have a medical understanding of why you feel that way, mm. that became a really interesting thing that we thought that Rick could deal through. Mm -hmm. And that gave Leo a good solid ground mm -hmm. in which to work and to build a character and to have a, a subtext going on inside of scenes that doesn't have to revolve around the story of the scene or doesn't need to be told overtly to an audience, we yeah. can just show in the day of the life of, of Rick Dalton. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we never say the words that he's bipolar, it's just... Look, I think he said it the best it possibly could be said. <laughs> I could add on to that, but that was the part of the discovery for me with you of, of how, to, how to bring that sort of emotional um, roller coaster to mm -hmm. Rick in that short period yeah. of time, and I think we, you know... Well, the emotional weight that grounds you to the floor. Yeah. That was the best acting I've ever seen in my whole life. Like you.